can, so if you are in a caloric deficit, and this kind of brings us into the protein, dietary protein requirements world a little bit. If you are in a caloric deficit, and but you are, and we should probably talk about what the protein requirements are, um, but let's say you are getting sufficient protein intake, daily protein intake to counter, to prevent your, your body from pulling protein out of your muscle, basically. Um, can you not lose the lean mass or muscle mass? Let's say you're not doing resistance training, but you are just getting the protein in. And say, say you're doing aerobic, but you're still in the caloric deficit, deficit but you're getting the protein. And Would, not lifting weights. You're not lifting weights. So the answer is it will help to preserve some lean mass, but you're still, no matter what you, if you are not lifting weights, I mean, this has been shown again over and over in research, you will lose, and well, I want to at least, I always hate to talk in absolutes because if you're very obese, uh, where you just have, a, let's say you're 100 pounds overweight, you can lose fat without losing muscle, much more red, because you just have so much fat to lose that the body's going to pull from the fat stores. But I'm talking when you're starting to get down into you know, people who just quote, are quote unquote overweight, uh, you're going to lose muscle. If you do not resistance train now, even if I want to point out though, even if you're lifting weights, if you are getting insufficient protein, it's going to, you're going to leach some muscle. So you, you need to still take in sufficient protein. And there's actually evidence that uh, you need more protein than uh, what has been shown for people at maintenance or above to maintain uh, muscle or even to gain it slightly when you're in a caloric deficit. So that actually increases protein needs to some extent. Can you talk about like what those yeah, sure. requirements so, are? This, we start to get into generalizations. So the general uh, literature sh shows somewhere around 1.6 to 1.8 grams per kilogram uh, per day of protein is required for resistance trained people, which is about double the RDA. So RDA for sedentary individuals is around 0.8 grams per kilograms per day, per kilogram per day. Um, you need roughly double that to you know, to uh, maintain or to promote anabolism while you're uh, resistance training. Uh, in the upper confidence interval is about 2.2 grams per kilogram. Uh, so meaning that to really be on the safe side, if you're, for the vast majority of people, if you're in the gen pop, it's probably not gonna make a difference. But if you're a bodybuilder, when I'm uh, coaching bodybuilders and uh, consulting with them, it really does not hurt to take in more protein. I mean, there's a lot of myths about kidney damage and healthy individuals, no good evidence that there's any negative effects on renal function, certainly on bone density. These are all uh, unsupported um, from my reading of the literature. Um, so there's not necessarily a downside to it. You have to look at cost benefit. Everything is cost benefit. For bodybuilders, I would say go up to two grams per kilogram per day, which roughly around for those of us in the States, it's about a gram per pound, it's not gonna hurt. But I would say that becomes even more important to stay in that upper realm. So if you're, like 1.6, if you're especially in a surplus, you generally need, the needs for protein are gonna be encompassed, because the body isn't gonna leach protein needs. When you start getting into a deficit, that's where I think it becomes even more important to uh, be at that upper realm, that uh, 2.0, 2.2 grams per kilogram. So people that are, let's say people that are obese, and I always say obese or overweight, and maybe it's important to distinguish these two based yeah. on what you just said, but if they are obese and or like, you know, overweight, um, and they're wanting to lose fat mass, right? Uh, should they be calculating their protein intake based on their targeted weight? Or because if they're like, you know, 300 pounds, for example, or, you know, that's a lot of protein. Right? Yeah, so. it's, a, it's a great question, and the answer is no. So the protein needs have been based on men and women who are relatively lean. I want to say relatively for the vast majority of the population, they would consider it lean. So for guys, somewhere like in the 12 to 15 percent body fat range, for women around 20 percent body fat or so. Um, so if you are 300 pounds and you should be 200 pounds, you would want, let's say you would calculate it at your uh, the weight that you would be where you would be at your lean weight, where, you know, for a guy, 12 to 15% body fat. 
So we can then regress to saying uh, base it on lean mass, but most people aren't getting DEXA scans to determine their lean mass, or even you know, they're not going out and getting body fat caliper uh, measurements, just not in the realm of what most people are going to do. And you can make a general estimate. These are not precise measurements. It's not like you know, people think that we're doing these experiments and they really nail it down into these precise areas. They're generalized recommendations based upon what we know, and there's going to be variations around the mean. You're always going to have people that are... When we uh, do research, we report the means, as you well know, which are the averages. But people aren't an average. You get some people that are up here, some people here, and they average out to here. So, um, yeah, so if you're uh, overweight, obese, you want to figure your protein needs at what you would be at a relatively lean weight. You know, let's say, for, again, for a guy, 10, 12, 15% body fat. I will say this, it doesn't hurt to take in, like I said, a little extra protein. That's, on the good side, uh, protein is very difficult to store as body fat, much more difficult than uh, carbohydrates and fat. So it's, um, if you're gonna err on the side of uh, caution, that's where you'd wanna err on the side of incre you know, taking in a little more protein at the expense, if your goal is weight loss, at the expense of carbs and fat. Right. Um, now we had um, Stuart Phillips on the podcast, a, a co colleague of yours, yeah, and um, he was talking about with the with the protein requirements, like the buy-in being more like, you know, just to get like at least one point two grams of uh, protein per per kilogram body weight. And for me, I was like, okay, because that that that's what I'm going to try to aim for. But then, as I started to become more um, do more resistance training, I realized I was meeting the buy-in but I wasn't meeting the 1.6. And so I have to now increase, like a can of sardines will get me there. Like I need about 16 to 20 more grams a day. Um, so, you know, for, for people like, I'm, like my dad, for example, he's in his 70s and um, like getting, good luck getting him to 1.6. <laughs> like I'm trying to get him to 1.2, right? I'm trying to like prevent him from like, just, you know, completely depleting his, you know, his amino acids from his pro from his muscle every day, which he's kind of doing. Um, so he has to supplement and do the protein protein shakes and stuff like that. Um, and I'm happy at least to get him there. Um, next step would be then 1.6, you know, and of course adding the resistance training, which should be essential, but I haven't been able to get to that point yet. Um, so I wanted to mention that with the protein requirements because, you know, the there was like I know the RDA is so low, 0 0.8, and um, Stuart talked a little bit about like some of the, the flaws in the early studies that were done to calculate that, and mm -hmm. I'm just like wondering when is it time to reassess this, you know, and and change it because a lot of people think they're they're getting enough protein, and uh, many people don't even get the RDA. So to address that, uh, two things I think that are important. So 1.2 is better than 0 0.8 certainly, but I mean there's Good literature showing, we've done work on this, that if you want to maximize anabolism, so again, it doesn't mean that you're not going to gain any muscle if you're taking in 1.2, but it will impair the gains that you're going to get, and especially when you're talking about older individuals, where that they're anabolically resistant. Uh, so it becomes even more important. And I think this is another important thing when you're dealing with older individuals, the resistance, uh, not only anabolic resistance to resistance training, but also to protein, where the per dose uh, aspects need to be higher to some extent to get what's called leucine, which is one of the essential amino acids. And there's, I don't know how deep you want to get here, yeah. but there's a leucine, leucine threshold. Leucine is the amino acid that seems to kickstart the muscle growth process. And um, if it seems to be somewhat higher, at least some of the literature does show that in older individuals getting more leucine is important to kickstart that process. As you point out though, and fairly, for older individuals, it becomes increasingly difficult to get uh, protein in. And I'm a big fan of whole foods. Like I, supplementation is something that you do when you cannot get whole foods in. But as you get older, taste buds start to uh, dissipate, your, your food does not have good taste. So older individuals have difficulty chewing sometimes too. And that is where supplementation can come in. It, it's much easier to drink a whey protein or a casein or egg protein shake and get that protein in uh, through supplemental means if you're not meeting your daily requirements. So I think that's where 
um, and for anyone. I mean, women, it, it seems that women often also uh, are not programmed to take protein as much. And uh, yeah, it's just very easy to do through protein shakes if you're not going to be able to do it through whole foods. What's the leucine threshold? Like, can you, um, like, in terms of protein, like, obviously, um, we'll get, we can get into the vegan, vegetarian, because it's a mm -hmm. whole other thing. But, like, if you're eating meat, chicken, poultry, fish, you know, if you're getting the essential amino acids, like, what gram dose per meal would you say would be important for that crossing that leucine threshold and what age? Yeah, that... so it's, these aren't, again, hard cutoffs in either of those. I've seen uh, three grams. Uh, where it starts to increase from two to three grams of leucine uh, as you get older. Where is that cut off from being quote unquote older? There isn't one. Uh, and if you don't necessarily, I certainly don't think you need to take leucine as a supplement if you're taking in a high quality protein uh, source. Um, you know, you're, if you're eating meat-based proteins, which by the way, aren't just meat, they're also milk and eggs, et cetera. So proteins from animal, I should say animal-based sources. Um, you're gonna be getting quality proteins that are rich in, in leucine. And uh, again, it's just getting the proper dosages in, which might be, it's been shown there is a graded, um, there's a recent study out of uh, Luke Van Loon's lab, who's a terrific researcher, protein researcher in the Netherlands. And uh, they looked at, again, my memory now, it's been a while since I looked at this study, but it was, they did, Zero, 15 grams of protein, I believe they used whey, uh, 30 and 45, I think it was. But anyway, it showed a dose-response relationship for muscle protein synthesis where they kept getting a greater response. Now, it did seem to somewhat, cur the uh, curve wasn't, it wasn't a linear uh, relationship, so there was you know more parabolic where it started to, uh, trail off after 30 grams, but it did continue on above the 30 grams. So uh, it just shows that in older individuals that uh, it's needed to take more per dose protein to hit that leucine threshold, particularly in the time after resistance training. I mean, yeah, that's talking about a dose that you're, you're, you're gonna have in your animal products, but then you're also probably gonna have a protein shake with it because it's quite, I mean, I guess unless you can eat large, large, large steaks and stuff. But um, for me, I know, as a female too, um, well, I, I mean, won't be getting- Four ounces of chicken is 30 grams of protein. Is it 30? So. so yeah, okay. I mean, it's four, you know, if you get- I eat four ounces so, of chicken. Yeah, yeah, so it's- Pretty good. Um, with respect to what we were talking about with the being in a caloric deficit and um, gaining muscle mass and how um, it's, you know, you have to do the resistance training and get the protein. But um, it seems as though gaining isn't, you're not going to be really gaining if you're, if you're in that caloric de deficit, if you're the person that is actively doing caloric restriction for recomp, like, you know, I guess aspects. But what about, you know, um, so like something I practice is time-restricted eating, where I like to eat all my food within a t like 10-hour window. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't go too crazy. But... You know, like I like to have a resting period, and you know, when you're when you're not digesting and all that, you are in a repair process, right? You're in repair mode. Um, the problem that a lot of people make with time restricted eating is they go, oh, in order to eat within this 10 hour window, I have to skip breakfast, right? So they skip meals, which ends up being caloric restriction in you know combined with the time restricted eating, um, and so. What I, I do is not skip meals. I do not skip breakfast. I do not skip meals um, unless, you know, there's some circumstantial thing that happens where I have to get somewhere or whatever, right? Um, but if I'm getting all of my protein within that 10-hour window, so it's more of a, it's a intermittent fasting but not being in a caloric deficit. So getting the same calories that I would get if I was eating my food throughout the day. Uh, and then I'm adding in resistance training, making sure I'm eating the protein, is that going to be conducive with, with gaining muscle mass? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, we actually are starting to get some good research on this topic. Now, time-restricted feeding, it's interesting you bring that up. I have a paper currently in review, or a review paper. A review paper currently in review with my colleague, uh, Alan Aragon, who's a big uh, nutritional expert. And um, it's, we covered this exact topic. Uh, the interesting thing with time-restricted feeding, number one, there's various iterations of it. So there's 420, 
So we have four hours eating and then uh, 20 hours off. There's six, 18, there's eight, 16. So there's all variations. Then there's also the um, two, five concept where you fast for two days and then uh, eat up five days or... So a lot of that will depend upon the specific uh, type of time-restricted feeding. What you're talking about, a 10-hour window, is much more friendly towards anabolism. But most of the it's interesting because conceivably, spacing out your protein would logically have benefits. And there's been some research, even longitudinal research, that backs, uh, backs this up, that uh, you get better utilization of protein if it's spread out, let's say, at least over three meals relatively spaced, like breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and perhaps even four. But now again, if you're, so this is where the nuances come in. If you're a bodybuilder, I would recommend trying to take in protein across the day as much as possible, because when you're not eating, you're catabolic. E eating is anabolic. So when not eating is catabolic. But for these studies on uh, time-restricted feeding really don't show much difference. Now, our measures that we have, our current measures of looking at uh, hypertrophy or you know, even MRI, which is the gold standard, still has a margin of error. It's not like we're doing, uh, you're, you're looking at a cadaver and you're actually you know, measuring or you're doing like rodent research where you actually can uh, weigh the muscle, et cetera. Uh, so our, our measures might not be sensitive enough to detect subtle differences, but for the vast majority of people, I mean, you're not looking to bodybuild, it's just not going to be much of a difference. If you're going to do a 420, I would say you're then going to be in a lot more, and, and there's been research, there's one study certainly showed uh, diminished anabolic, uh, diminished muscle hypertrophy with a 420 versus a traditional eating pattern. I could see where a 2.5 might be have issues. So again, I would say if you're going to, whatever you do, uh, try to structure your training within that eating window that you have. Because, the, and there's actually been quite a lot of research on this, that the body is highly anabolic for at least 24 hours, if not more, after a workout. But when you start getting outside of, you know, six, eight hours or so, it's probably going to trail off where you might not harvest some of the gains, depending upon what you're looking for. Uh, you know, if you're, especially if your goals are more optimizing muscle mass. So I, I would say it's beneficial to try to get the f uh, feeding in within that window, wh whatever it is. If you're going to be, let's say, in a 10-hour window, try to, tra try to train within the earlier part of that eating so that you're going to be able to eat after your workout and not go, let's say, not do it right after your final meal and then be catabolic for 14 hours. Okay, so is there some... With the anabolic window, is there some? It's really, kind a, bar, it's really a barn door. It. Yeah, we've done a ton of research on this. So certainly, it, it's there is somewhat of a window. And even in the paper we publish, which people take, there's no anabolic window. That's not what our research showed, but it showed that it's really minor. The much more important thing is getting your total daily protein intake, in. and that's what we're kind of to your point. If you're hitting your daily protein requirements, if whatever your window is. Uh, if you're doing, let's say, certainly 10 hours, but even like a 8-16, which is the most common uh, time-restricted feeding uh, strategy, um, if you're getting 1.6 grams per kilogram, you're, you're pretty good. You're going to get the majority of your gains regardless. Then it starts to come down. You kind of mentioned this with uh, Stu Phillips uh, in similar veins. That that's kind of like the, now you're starting to get more like the cherry on the sundae here if you want to eke out the maximum amount of gains. And really it's, like I said, more of a barn door. It's not this narrow window. And the, the I think what we've debunked is that after 45 minutes you, oh my God, I gotta slam my shake immediately after training or I go catabolic. And even if you're an advanced bodybuilder, I don't think there's utility, the utility in that is virtually nil. But I do say like, when I'm coaching bodybuilders, you know, get your protein in as quickly as you can after a workout. You don't have to stress and, slam your shake the minute you finish your last set. But um, because small, this is where even small amounts of gains can be the difference between winning and losing a competition. So again, it's highly context specific. We, we try to make these general guidelines and apply it to the population, but everyone has their own you know, goals, their own lifestyle that they have to deal with and other factors. And that needs to be taken into account. If you are working out at home, let's say, and you can go, and you're not a professional bodybuilder, you're a rec recreational, 
you know, I guess I wouldn't call it a gym goer if you're doing it at home, but you're a recreational at home gym goer. Um, and you can go and take your shake right after your workout because you're at home and it's not stressful and you don't have to think about packing it and all this. I mean, would that it's not going to hurt? And it could have, like, it, even if it helps a tiny a bit, bit right. it's, yeah, I would say it's that is the cost benefit where there is really no cost and a, a potential very small benefit. Uh, now, again, if you start going longer and longer, if you're taking five, six, seven, eight hours, and again, if you're doing a, let's say, a 10, 14, and you train right after your last meal, uh, and then go 14 hours, then you can start compromising some gains. So there's no hard rule to this. It's on a spectrum. But I would say the quicker you can get it in, conceivably, the better. It's just no downside to it. With your, with your, um, you mentioned the the aging study where um, the the fellow from the Netherlands was looking at, I guess on a you know per per meal um, effect with respect to protein intake and muscle protein synthesis. Um, is it like you know you're you're not going to have three like most people aren't going to do three meals with forty or fifty grams of protein. I mean, without supplementing on top of that. Like maybe, you know, maybe there's, there's you know, some, some people that will do it, but not like, not all the women, not all the older folks, you know, for the, for the majority, I think of those types of people, they might not be taking in that much protein per, per meal. Should they try to at least get 40 grams in, in, in at least one meal? Um, uh, yeah, you know, or, I, I mean. Or is 30 enough? I mean, so is 40 better than 30 for these older people? Is it something they should even think about? Or is it like just the, the cherry on top, but you don't stress yourself kind of thing? You so, know? Yeah, it's great questions. And one of the things I think that needs to be understood is that um, the studies are sterile. So what I mean by that is that they're taking people, they're going to look at kind of proof of principle. So they take them fasted, they're having nothing in their body, and they're giving them a weight, let's say a whey protein shake. Whey is a very fast-acting protein that gets into your body very quickly, uh, into your circulatory system. The body gets to use the amino acids quickly. When you're eating a whole meal, the amino acids are released in a much more time-released fashion because uh, the body has to digest the food, break it down. There's fats that are going to delay absorption. So again, you're eating, let's say, chicken with um, you know, broccoli and rice, etc. You're eating a, a whole meal. Um, there's time delayed release of, uh, of nutrients into your body. So you don't, that's why I said the most important thing, 90% is targeting your, I, I hate to give exact percentages because I'm just pulling that out of the air, but I just want to emphasize the vast majority is getting your uh, total daily, worrying about getting your total daily protein intake, stressing over this, you know, minutia of how much is in the meal. If you're getting, if an older individual is taking in 1.6 grams, they're going to be doing fine. They're, they're not going to be meaningfully compromising their gains unless they're looking to bodybuild, do a master's level bodybuilding show. Okay. Well, that's good to know. I mean, for the people like, like us, you know. <laughs>